So today we're talking about being close to the kingdom. You notice that's what Jesus says at the end of this whole thing. We often in this passage focus a lot on what Jesus says about the great commandment, and it is important, and we'll get into that. But that little thing at the end, I think, is often missed out. (coughs) When Jesus said to the man who answered wisely, you're not far. You're not far from the kingdom. And that might be even part of the point of the reason this is even in the scripture, the reason that Mark put it in, the Holy Spirit wanted it here. You're not far from the kingdom. How many of us might be not far from the kingdom? How many of our friends might be not far from the kingdom? What does it mean to be not far from the kingdom? What does it mean to make God the most important thing in our lives? So this is a chapter, chapter 12, and I I wrestled quite a lot with which part of chapter 12 to speak on today because there's so much good stuff in the chapter. So I have written some notes on the, the handout there. But this chapter has a bit of everything. It has, it has teaching of Jesus. It has questions uh, aimed at him, questions also by him of the people around him. It's got controversy. There's hostility. There's a parable. There's warnings. There's positive example. There's inspiration. There's so much here, just in this one chapter. And today, what I decided to do was to pick on probably the most famous part of the chapter, And there is a danger in that, because you'll have heard this before, and you'll have heard this a few times probably. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. It's not something that any of us here, I expect, have never heard before. So I'm going to ask you to do what I've tried to do, which is take a fresh look at this and think carefully about what it means for you and me and for those who might be not far from the kingdom, close to the kingdom. So the next slide, thank you, Stefan, for doing the slides. If your house was on fire, you woke up at three in the morning, your house is on fire, and you've got 30 seconds to grab whatever you can, what are you going to take out of your house? Wife and kids. kids. That is, of course, the correct answer. Other answers are acceptable. The house cat. The house cat. (laughs) If it hasn't already left, you'll grab the house cat. Yes, okay. Mobile phone? Okay, the phone that has the whole of our lives in it these days. What else might you take? Cash, my external hard drive. External hard drive with all of your life in it. Cash, someone said. You, you've got that much cash in your house? Okay, sometimes. Behind you? If I had the time, I'd get our passports. Passports. Okay, yes. The coffee machine. <laughs> The coffee machine. Wow. Wow, we're really getting to to know each other better here, aren't we? What a priority. Anything else? What else would you take? Your dog. Of course, the dog. You can't neglect it. The cat, the dog, the coffee machine, passports, cash. Anything else? What would you grab? Maybe the laptop, like the hard drive or the phone and things like that. There are certain things that we wouldn't have to think much about. Pair of shoes. You wake up, jump out of bed, pair of shoes. Wise man. You see, Leon is a very practically oriented person. Yes. Your Bible, Bill. That is also the correct answer. <laughs> Go to the top of the class. <laughs> gold star for Bill. <laughs> you know, it's when you're when you're pushed into a corner like that, it's a crisis moment. It clarifies everything. And you would probably not have to think very carefully about what you would grab. If you're really organized, like my wife, she has a file somewhere in the house with all these important documents in, like passport and a few things like that. And so she'd just run to that and grab that file and everything's in it that needs to come out of the house. But I'm not quite that organized. But nevertheless... Like the, at times, there are times when the most important things become clear. And I think what Jesus is dealing with here is he's trying to help his hearers and people like us today to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing, that we don't get distracted by even good things from the main thing. When life gets busy and life gets difficult, because Jesus, one of the things that Jesus is doing in the run-up to this chapter and even in this chapter is his purifying the temple. 
and there's a picture of uh, a mock-up of um, the temple of Jesus' day uh, built by Herod there at the, on the slide. And he's purifying the temple, turning over the tables, you may remember, Cut, set, uh, make, getting rid of the money changers in the temple courts and things like that. And he's doing that, but I think also by giving us this teaching, in a sense, he's teaching us how to purify our own temples, who we are, the temple of the Holy Spirit that a Christian has. And that temple is being purified by what Jesus is teaching here. So let's spend a few minutes going through this chapter, and then we'll, um, we'll see if we can find some application for us. And I have a question for you to answer in a little bit, but we'll come to that shortly. So what do we have here? We have a teacher of the law or a scribe. And they were entrusted with making sure with making sure that God's word was transmitted from generation to generation. So they knew the Old Testament, the law, the Torah, they knew it really, really well. And he comes, here's the debate going on between Jesus, between the Sadducees just before this, Pharisees and Herodians just before that, and others, all debating with Jesus and actually losing the debates to Jesus. And he comes, notices that Jesus gives a good answer, and then asks the question. And I think it's helpful for us now and again to realize that not everybody that's out there that is opinionated and religious is always a persecutor or a critic. This person seemed to have a sincere heart with his questions. And we need to have that kind of heart towards God's word, wanting to learn more. And he says, of all the commandments, which is the most important, the most important one is this. And he goes on, and there are reckoned to be about 613 commandments in the Old Covenant. So imagine you had a tick list for the day. Do you ever have a to-do list for your day? And you tick things off as you go along. Imagine having 613 and you need to get those ticked every day. I'm not suggesting that in Judaism you had to do that, but just imagine the burden of knowing there are even 613 of them. I mean, that's quite heavy. But this man wants to know, well, of all of them, what's what's the most important? What's the chief commandment is, I think, what he's really asking here. In Judaism, and the reason that picture's up there, in Judaism there were three main sort of planks for Judaism. There was the temple, which we've talked about, There's the Torah, that's the scrolls you can see right there, a photograph taken at the uh, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. You've got the Torah, and then you've got the idea in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, of Israel being the special chosen people. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all peoples on the face of the earth to be his possession, his treasured possession. And so if you were Jewish and in those days, these three things would give you great security. We have the temple, we have the law, and we have been chosen. And indeed, all those things were true. And it is true that you could be very, um, you could, if you were a Jew in those days, you might feel very confident about that and very, very much uh, glad for that. Of course, no problem. But what Jesus is doing is he's beginning the process of chipping away at their reliance on those things and missing the fact that they're often missing the real point. And there's a new covenant coming. The temple is no longer going to be the physical temple. Indeed, Jesus is now coming, in a sense, as the temple to to enable us to be temples. The Torah is giving way to the new covenant. And the people, exclusively those chosen by God as the Jewish nation, is now all who will take on the new covenant. And he's chipping away at that and trying to help them to expand their thinking. So you can imagine that for a Jew of the day to hear what Jesus says as he's casting doubt on these three foundational aspects of your faith would be very disturbing. Some of the one of the reasons he got so much opposition. And this scribe is intending to test his orthodoxy on the first and greatest of the planks, if you like, the law. And so he asks the question. He asked the question, now I don't know, what's that next slide, Stefan? Because I don't know which ones have been coming across in the cloud or not. Okay, so let's leave that one up. Thank you very much. The first thing Jesus says is he says, Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Does anybody know what that's called? It has a name. It's, it's in Judaism. The Shema. Okay, it's the Shema. Something from Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 that Jewish families would say every day, would be repeated often. It's foundational. And it's interesting that the first thing Jesus says is actually not a commandment. It's a reminder. The reminder comes first. Because the reminder is it's about God, not about words, not about a command as such. It's about the nature of God. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love him with all your heart. That's the Shema he's emphasizing there. And then he goes on to that command, love the God with all your heart. And then also Leviticus 19 verse 18, which was in the Old Covenant as well. Uh, don't seek to uh, revenge, bear a grudge. Love your neighbor as yourself. So it's in the Old Covenant, not just something Jesus uh, makes up, if you like, here. I think the great thing about these commands is that they're positives, aren't they? Don't you prefer a positive command? Rather than don't do this and don't do that and make sure you don't do that. I mean, in parenting, this can be a bit of a challenge because we tend to find our children doing all the things we'd rather they didn't do. And it can become a bit of a mantra in a household, can't it, of don't do that. Why are you doing that? And I told you not to do that. And there's a place for reminders of things not to do, but it's a more healthy parenting style most of the time, if you can, to emphasize what is good. And this is the way God treats us. Love God. Love your neighbor. It's a positive thing. Heart. He talks about the heart, the soul, and Jesus adds in here uh, the heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I'm not going to try and pull these apart and, well, mind means this, strength means that. They, it's, I think it's legitimate, perhaps, to do that. But for the purposes of today's lesson, I don't want to pull that apart. I want to keep it sort of together because it's about all, isn't it? I think the key word here is not, um, is not heart, is not soul, is not mind, is not strength. I think the key word is all. With all of these things, with all of what you've got. What's on that next slide, Stefan? Let's have a look. Ah, that one's there, good. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do for a couple of minutes. Turn to the person sitting next to you and have a chat about what does this mean and maybe what doesn't it mean. There. What are some things it does mean? Anybody? Yeah? The main focus is God. The main focus is God. Okay, what else does it mean? It's a general attitude. Okay, I like that. Yeah, good. All right. What else? What does it mean? In your life, not just in your head. It's in your life. Yep. In conversation with God all the time. So relational. Okay, it's in life. It's relational. It's an attitude. Simon. Right, giving God quality time, yeah, not just when it's when we feel like it, and yeah, yeah, very good. Again, it's a relational element that you're you're pulling out. Anything else? A reminder of how to how to live our lives. A reminder, yeah. Okay, good, yeah, good. A couple more, yeah. An effort to resist temptations. Making that effort. Effort's involved, isn't it? Yeah, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Akin? I think really making a effort to get to know God. Because people think you've got to know what you know about Yeah, it's love, right? Yeah. Wanting to get to know him and understand him, yeah? Yeah, it's also that um, the devil can't ask him to do something. And when we love God with our heart, we just desire to get to his good heart and get to know him. Right. Yes, keeping our temple in the right condition for his presence. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, what about what it doesn't mean? Might be the harder question, I don't know, but I thought it'd be good for us to think about this. What does it not mean, do you think, Danny? We talked about, I'm not quite sure which comment was going, but I was trying to get like, I don't know, some scripture is quite difficult to get your head around. Okay. When things get tough and complicated, it doesn't mean running away from it. As I get older, depression means actually I can't understand 
to actually start saying I've got this disease or I've got all these challenges I need to read my mind my whole mind and try and get to that point where I've got Jesus Christ say mm. okay not just gloss over it and forget it alright there's some effort involved there yeah good okay what else what else doesn't it mean Tyra you can love God and hate his creation you can't love God and hate his creation okay Indeed, that is true. Victor? I think it, it does not mean that you can ignore your neighbor's needs because you want to serve God. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> is that not allowed? <laughs> no, I, I'm thinking of the, of, the, uh, of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. 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 Who is my neighbor? That, that's that big question, isn't it? Good. Thank you. Yes. We can't ignore our neighbor for the sake of, no, 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 I'm loving God over here. I haven't got time for you, neighbor. I'm, okay. Yeah. Very good point. Okay. Uh, Simon again. Conforming to the pattern of this world. Okay, you should be able to tell the difference. Okay, good. Yeah, Akin. Does it mean pleasing people or doing what people want to see me do for life? Does it mean that? Is that really true? Well, that's a really good point. If someone who appears to be authoritative, knowledgeable, perhaps more experienced or older, says, if you want to know how to love God, you should do it like this. There could be a temptation to, to short-circuit your own thinking and own your own Bible study. So okay, that's what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength without actually having a look yourself. That would be very dangerous, wouldn't it? It's a really good point. Yeah, Kaiser. Only when you're in trouble. Only when you're in trouble. Don't resort to that when you're only, only when you're in trouble. That's right. It's more than just crisis times, Pat. Okay, no, not comparing, right? So, yes, I love God with all my heart, heart my, my, anything, all of who I am. And uh, you choose to do it a different way, but of course you're doing it wrongly. Uh, so that sort of judgment of other people's wholeheartedness. I was thinking more in terms of what they do, this, you know, this conversation, why do this conversation, uh -huh. why that will work. So okay, that all right. <laughs> Where do we measure up in that way? Uh, Stefan. Okay, all right. So there's a point there which we'll come on to a bit more. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, somebody else's hand. Yes. Um, it doesn't mean following commands. You know, it's expected that the child Okay, so just because we have the form of Christianity doesn't mean that we're loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Okay, uh, yes, Tyler. It should be constant and continuous. Constant, continuous. All right. Not like David. Yeah. Not like David. Oh, David. Okay. Okay, it's an important point. Yeah, turn back. Yeah, I think it doesn't mean doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> definitely doesn't mean that. <laughs> Actually, yes, because you know, loving God with all your heart, you know, you come across these people, you know, they know before you say or before they say one thing, they know, you know, <laughs> they're going to put the scripture up to you. Oh, this is what the scripture says, this is what it says. But in your heart, you're like, yeah, I know the scripture. But, you know, I just need you to show me love. And just be a friend so that mm -hmm. I can get through this. And, um, and it's, all, it's something so easy to do. So, so that's what I mean by, you know, loving God. It doesn't mean being a good person. Mm -hmm. it yeah, it doesn't mean being obnoxiously religious. Right? And just, you know, quoting scripture at every problem without listening and caring, right? I, I think it does mean knowing our scriptures, 
but it's like you don't use all the clubs in the golf bag for every shot, right? You pick out the one that's, anyway. So, okay, good. Let's, let's move on and do a little bit of a wrap up before we take communion. Here's the thing I think overall I would say about this. Oh, yes, I meant to show this, sorry. Okay, so yeah, can you do one more click because that'll play a video. Yeah, so this is a video I took when I was in Israel a few years ago. This is the Western Wall. And uh, for those of us who had the privilege uh, to be there, this is how it looks uh, these days. It's the only part of the original temple sort of still standing. Uh, the rest of it was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Uh, various bits have been, sort of been rebuilt. Now, of course, there's a, a mosque uh, on the top there. But uh, Jewish people come from all over the world to pray here at the Western or the Wailing Wall insert their prayer requests written on pieces of paper into the cracks of the wall. If you go up close to the wall, you can see them inserted in there. You can do the next slide, Stefan. And uh, the, 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 there's a, the men pray on where you can main part you can see there. The women pray on another part over to the uh, right-hand side. Next slide. And I didn't realize until someone looked at me with a stern face that I wasn't supposed to be taking photographs. Um, that was very naughty of me. But anyway, so... It's a very sacred place for Jewish people. And on the next slide, it even continues underground. You've got people in there reading their Torahs, um, praying, and it's, it's, it's an astonishingly significant place for people from a Jewish background. And what Jesus is essentially saying here is Jesus would not denigrate the temple <coughs> as such, but what he is saying is that the quality of love that we have for God and our relationship with him, our, our gratitude for him is more important than any outward aspect of our faith. It's more important even than a temple that God came to inhabit. In, in that sense, the Shekinah came and God came down to that temple. And J Jesus is saying, well, when all is said and done, no. And the teacher of the law very interestingly, and he's the only one we know of that heard Jesus that got the point. Because the teacher of the law said, you're right in saying God is one, there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is, and he adds this, Jesus didn't say this, he says, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. He sees it. He is a scribe. He is a teacher of the law. He knows the significance of the sacrifices. He would have participated in all the festivals, the Passover and everything else, and he would have done that wholeheartedly. But he manages to see something that no one else seemed to be able to grasp in the time of Jesus, which is that that is peripheral compared to having that relationship with God, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. Because Jesus came to redefine all that. And this is so important still today. We don't have a physical temple, but it's still important today because Christendom has a habit of collectively and personally building up a scaffolding around our faith. That the, the way we sing this matters, the way we do that matters, the way we pray or the building we meet in or the way that we function as a congregation, that these are the things that, 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 that are in danger of defining our Christian life and we forget and we miss it's about love for God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what gets us up a little bit earlier to spend some time in prayer. It gets us up a little bit earlier to read our Bible or stay up a bit later or turn off the TV and spend that time to read our Bible, not because it's part of a church program or because it's something that someone told us to do, even though I'm, I'm suggesting it now. But that's not the point. It's about, it's about God, isn't it? Why did I get into this God stuff in the first place? Why did I get... Why did I come along? Why, why did I even read the Bible to start with? Why did I study it? Why did I decide to, to become a Christian? It's because of God. It's not because he gives me all I want. It's not because everything about the way church functions is the way I would prefer it to be. It's about God, fundamentally, foundationally. It's all about loving him with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. And it seems to me that this teacher of the law understood something. That I think we understand, but can slip. You know, we can slip. We can forget what it's really all about. And so I certainly do from time to time. And I'm sure 
We all have this struggle. And it's a shame because for well, lots of reasons, but imagine all of us habitually loving God with everything we have and loving our neighbor as ourselves. What difference it would make to our lives, to our fellowship, and to our world. What difference would it make to this world if the goal of the COP26 summit was to love God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength and love neighbors' self? What would it be like if the next debate in the Commons, the House of Parliament, was all about let's lo- how do we figure out how to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor? What difference would that make to party politics, to policies? We can speculate about that, but the point being, this is the way to make the world a better place and to draw us into a better relationship with God is by loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourself. It's not complicated, but it is hard. And maybe that's why we struggle with it. It is hard. Let's be honest. That's why we need each other. We need each other in community to reinforce what we've already agreed to. We've already agreed, if we're a Christian, I want to do this. I'm fighting it hard. Brother, sister, help me, because I can't do it on my own. It's why we're in each other's lives. It's why we talk. It's why we pray together. It's why we meet each up, meet up together. It's why we do things together. It's because it's hard, but with Christ, it's possible. And with the community around us, well... We can be what God has called us to be. Uh, The next slide reminds us that this is not a new idea. In the Old Covenant, Samuel uh, reminded Saul that the Lord, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. And in Hosea 6, verse 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Next slide. Paul says this in Romans 13. This is a great summary. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. What a Beautiful way to wrap up so many important things. So let me make a couple of points and then we'll uh, pray together before we take bread and wine uh, to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus says to this man, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He understands some very fundamental things, but he's not quite there. And we don't know what was standing in his way. Jesus presumably did. Maybe they had a conversation after this. We don't know. But I just wanted to say this for any of us here who perhaps believe in God. Perhaps you trust him on some level. Perhaps you love him or want to love him. Perhaps you're not far from the kingdom. But perhaps there's something about this all heart, soul, mind, and strength that you need to resolve so that you can be in the kingdom where Jesus wants you to be. He wants you to enjoy that relationship with him. Maybe if that's not where you are, then maybe it's time to to decide to seek out what it means to be in the kingdom, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, what it means to deal with the sins in your life, the the issue of repentance, perhaps what it means to deal with being baptized into Christ. There's a baptistry under here, isn't there? Wouldn't it be good to see it in use? It'd be good. Take the top off. And and maybe there's there's a, a place for that for some of us even here today that we haven't yet made that decision. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Become a disciple. Repent of sin. Get baptized into Christ. Start that new life. And begin making your difference in the world of loving your neighbor as yourself. Maybe that's for some of us here. And for others of us, I said, I think for me, the thing that stands out to me is to remember that my Christian life is not about a a way of doing things. It's about an attitude that you talked about, Leon. It's about an attitude. We're told to walk like Christ. 
That's an, a lifestyle. Several of you mentioned that. And I think that's maybe the key point for us here is that we're, we're not trying to be Christians like, um, like some of you who have a Fitbit and try to get your 10,000 steps a day. We're not trying to reach some level. That's not the point. It's about, am I all in on this? And it's a good reminder to us to be all in on what it means to have a relationship with God. Jesus sets the example, and he is the inspiration. So we go to, we think about these things in the light of the fact that he gave everything for us. He showed us what it meant to love God with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength, and how to love your neighbor as yourself, because he went to the cross, and he did it willingly. Willingly for you and me and for everybody. And what a wonderful inspiration. And that's what inspires us to go and live our lives for him. And taking the bread and wine as we will in a moment, taking these uh, emblems representing his body and blood, these are to remind us, and they are to strengthen our faith, even though they're only material. By taking them with the attitude of gratitude for what Christ has done, it strengthens our faith. It gives us courage to live wholeheartedly for Christ and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so I'm going to ask someone to come up and pray. We can have that next slide, I think. And Victor's going to come pray for us. And then we will take bread and wine together. Mm-hmm.